Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching the Today I Found Out YouTube channel. And in the video today, we've got a viewer suggestion video. This one comes from John Lee Pettimore. So thank you very much, John. So in the video, we're looking at whether NASA actually spent millions of dollars developing a space pen while the Russians just used a pencil. We're also going to look at who invented the ballpoint pen. A commonly touted story circulating around the interwebs is that NASA found out pens didn't work in space, but still needed a writing device that would work there, so they spent millions of taxpayer dollars developing a ballpoint pen that could be used in space. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, just used pencils. So is this true, and who invented the ballpoint pen, and how do they work? The humble ballpoint pen is an item so ubiquitous, the chances of you not having one near you right now are so low, E.T. could probably give you the percentage on his right hand. Few people realize just how much technology, craftsmanship, and effort goes into creating a single pen, probably because you can buy 30 of them for a few dollars, only to have mysteriously lost them all within a week. As the name would suggest, ballpoint pens work by utilizing tiny metal ball bearings. In the case of the most famous ballpoint pens of all, Bic the ball is commonly made from tungsten carbide, which is notably the same material often used to make armor-piercing bullets. After the material has been shaped, it's then highly polished in a machine that uses a paste made from diamonds. Yes, we're still talking about those pens that banks give away for free and you've lost three of today. The polished ball is then loaded into a socket. Due to the fact that the space available between these two parts is supposed to be virtually, but not quite nil, they need to be accurate to within a thousandth of a centimeter on the ball. If any flaws whatsoever are discovered in the ball bearings during production, it's not uncommon common for thousands of others of these balls that were created alongside the flawed one to be destroyed as well. In fact, to see any imperfections on a ballpoint pen's ball bearing that makes it to market, you need an electron microscope. So how does the ink even get out? Well, it works mostly via gravity. Gravity pulls the ink down onto the ball, which transfers ink as it is dragged along or pressed against paper or a comparable surface. However, the ball bearing also creates a pressurized seal that prevents excess ink from escaping. The mechanism allows for a continuous flow of ink to be used without risking the ink inside being exposed to air and thus drying out. This allows ballpoint pens to write around 100,000 words each. The long and short of it is, is that without gravity or some sort of internal pressure source, like in space pens, the ink won't flow properly. So this brings us to the space pens. So the story goes that the space race was heating up. NASA invested millions, sometimes stated as billions, into developing a pen that would work in orbit. However, when the Russians went into space, they just took pencils. It's a famous story that is mostly false. Although Soviet cosmonauts did use pencils in space for a time, so did the Americans. However, it quickly became clear that pencils were a very bad idea since they had a habit of breaking and sending tiny eye-seeking fragments of pencil lead and wood bits into the air. There were also some minor concerns over these fragments potentially damaging equipment, even perhaps causing a fire. So there was a need for pens that could work in space, but neither NASA nor the Russians invested any money into such a space device. Where NASA did waste money, funny enough, was on specially designed pencils, which further spurred the need to find a good alternative. In 1965, they paid a whopping $4,382.50, that's $31,949 today, for just 34 pencils made by Taikan Engineering Manufacturing Incorporated. Needless to say, the public was not happy with the way their tax dollars were being spent in this instance. And in truth, contrary to what many seem to think today, investing tax dollars into the space race at all had extremely tenuous public support. At this point in the video, you might be wondering, well, if neither the Soviets nor NASA invested any money into the creation of a pen that could work in space, well, who did? Like Tang and Velcro, often incorrectly credited with having been invented by NASA, the space pen was invented in the private sector and was simply popularized by NASA. Specifically, the development of the space pen was undertaken solely by Paul C. Fisher & Co. of the Fisher Pen Company. After investing over a million dollars of his own money in creating a pen, 
then they utilized pressurized nitrogen, 35 psi, to force out a specialized unique gel-like ink Fisher formulated. By 1965, he was in possession of a patent and a pen that could work upside down underwater at temperatures from minus 50 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, that's minus 45 to 204 degrees Celsius, and even, you guessed it, in space. When Fisher brought his AG-7 pen to the attention of NASA, they tested it thoroughly and then thanked Fisher by buying 400 pens from him. But he didn't get the Ticam engineering rate of $128.90 per writing device. Rather, they asked for a bulk discount and Fisher ended up selling them the pens for just under $2.39 a piece, which is about $17.42 today, which is approximately 40% off the normal consumer price at the time of $3.98. Then again, having NASA and by 1969 the Soviet Union use his product in space was great advertising, so he did okay. And versions of the Fisher Space Pen are still available today, and write very well, I might add. If you want to get one, we'll put a link to one in the description below. This price of $2.39 for a pressurized space pen is not only notable for being 40% off the consumer price at the time, but also notable because a mere two decades before, a standard ballpoint pen would cost you at its cheapest five to ten times that, well over $100 when adjusting for inflation. All of this changed thanks to one Marcel Bich in the mid-1950s. But before we get to Bich, we must discuss a newspaper editor named Laszlo Biro. While in Hungary in 1931, Biro observed that the ink used in a printing press dried almost instantly. He, like so many others, was also frustrated by the fact that fountain pen ink often smudged, among other annoyances. Thus, he worked to create a pen that used this type of newspaper quick-drying ink. His early efforts using fountain pens with this ink failed, which led him to attempt a ballpoint-style pen. But the ink still wasn't quite working. Fast forward to 1938, after working with his chemist brother Georgi, the two developed an ink that would dry near instantly, but still flow well. Biro also perfected a semi-new system that would deliver that ink effectively. So it was that on June 15, 1938, Biro patented the first commercially viable ballpoint pen. As with most inventions, the system he came up with, the one involving a precisely made ball and socket, wasn't entirely unique. For instance, a near-identical invention had been developed and patented some 50 years earlier, in 1888, by John J. Loud. However, Loud developed the device as a means of marking and writing on leather, something fountain pens couldn't do well. A lack of interest in his invention, as well as poor performance of the device due to flaws in the design, prevented it from becoming commercially successful, and he never renewed his patent. Many others came along in between Loud and Biro with similar devices that were similarly failures for various reasons, such as uneven ink flow, clogging, and leakage. In the end, Biro's pens were the first commercially viable ballpoint writing devices. Because of this, not only is he generally given credit for inventing the ballpoint pen, but the name by which many ballpoint pens are still known in many parts of the world today is Biro. Of course, Biro's pens were ludicrously expensive compared to the ballpoint pens we can buy today. But despite this, they were still considered hugely superior to other types of pens, mainly due to the fact that they required no external ink and that they worked in a variety of conditions. The British Air Force in particular were fond of Biro's produced by the Miles Martin Pen Company due to the fact that they worked at varying pressures and altitudes. Fountain pens were giving the British Air Force a lot of trouble at high altitudes. So this all brings us back to Bich and how ballpoint pens finally became not only extremely popular, but ridiculously cheap given the precision required in their making. Bich saved his money until he could afford to buy a rundown factory in France, a factory that would soon become the center of his massive pen empire. After acquiring the factory, Bich bought the right to Biro's ballpoint pen patent and perfected the means of mass production while maintaining quality. He then started creating as many pens as he possibly could. As he mass-produced millions upon millions of them, Bich was able to undercut his biggest rivals and sell pens that were as much as one three hundredth of the then normal price. In addition, due to his exacting mass production methods, along with being hundreds of times cheaper, his pens were also better quality in terms of their utility. Write the first time, every time, as the 1960s company advertising slogan went. Needless to say, sales and the popularity of the ballpoint pen skyrocketed, and by the time Bich entered the American market, he was able to sell the pens for pennies instead of dollars. And the rest, as they say, is history. 
So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below this video and do subscribe to our channel for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also over there on the right, a couple of other videos that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one. And thanks for watching.